let's talk about collective action problems and the tragedy of the commons. Another tragedy, not a tragedy of the commons, is that uh, when I do this in class, I have this great little in-class simulation where students simulate a tragedy of the commons and they get to see a close and personal exactly what the logic is of a tragedy that comes by experiencing it. But sadly, that doesn't really translate well uh, to uh, video lectures. And maybe one of these days I'll, I'll try to record it or something. But uh, we'll do what we can with the uh, boring lecture format. So a collective action problem is a multiplayer prisoner's dilemma. We've been talking about it for a while now, but we never really came out and said it. Um, and it's the most common dilemma that political institutions are created to solve. So when you ask why do we have politics, why do we have all these rules, why do we have all of this, much of the explanation can boil down to the fact that we are trying to solve collective action problems between a uh, myriad uh, of individuals uh, who are trapped in suboptimal situations, that is to say, and which they can't get out of on their own. That is to say, unilateral action will not solve the problem. In other words, just like in a prisoner's dilemma, uh, citizens are stuck in a suboptimal equilibrium. They could get to a better stage if they cooperate, but on their own, they cannot improve their situation. And that is a tragedy. Now, as we've talked about already, ultimately it's intimately connected to the role of government in the provision of public goods. Actually, I don't know what order you're going to be watching those videos in, so maybe you haven't looked at public goods and collective action problems yet. So the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons is the name for a collective action problem faced by individuals who would be better off conserving a resource. So this is about natural resources, uh, particularly the exhaustible kind of natural resources. So we're not talking about sunlight so much, uh, but we are talking about um, things that are uh, renewable but exhaustible. So think of fishing stocks or uh, grass or uh, even to some extent uh, oxygen. Um, so we have individuals who would be better off as a group conserving a resource, but face strong incentives as individuals to use up more of that resource than would be socially beneficial. And in the really bad cases, they uh, use it uh, to the point where they destroy the resource itself and its capacity to renew itself. So in the case of fish stocks or oyster stocks, uh, in some cases, uh, or endangered species, in some cases, uh, the species and the renewable resource disappears uh, before it can be saved. Now. The tragedy of the commons explains why, absent any coordinated action among users of common pool resources, common pool resources is another term for uh, the kind of resource that's renewable but exhaustible, uh, to which everybody has access. Um, it explains why, without any kind of coordinated action uh, between users, uh, fish stocks disappear for the oceans, uh, endangered species become endangered from overhunting. Uh, streets become dirty with litter, the air becomes unhealthy from pollution, public library books end up stolen or missing, and perhaps why the earth is heating up from carbon dioxide emissions. These examples all share a common set of characteristics, is that you have a resource like fish or air or streets or library books that is available for all to use, and the cost of using the resource is smaller than the cost of society or cost to society of the user using the resource. That is to say, uh, it is fairly cheap for you to use the resource, but it's slightly more expensive for all of us to be using the resource, or for society, for uh, society, for you to use the resource. Okay, let's see if we can uh, refine this a little bit. Now, the name arises from economists in the 19th century who noted that common grazing pastures of villages in England, which was a traditional way of grazing small stocks of livestock, were often in poor condition compared with the private or enclosed pastures. The sheep grazing on these common pastures ended up being strawnier because of a lack of grass compared with the enclosed pastures. And the explanation that these economists came up with is that shepherds grazing their flocks on the commons couldn't do anything on their own about the state of the common pastures. If they didn't graze their sheep on the pasture, someone else would. And since everybody understands that if they don't do it, someone else will, then everybody tried to graze as much as they could. They put as many sheep on the commons as they could. Now, what happened then is the pasture became overgrazed to the point where even the grass seeds were getting eaten uh, by the livestock.
and the grass could not grow back, which ended up leaving the animals underfed or starving in later seasons. Right, So you can see that in order for the grass to be sustainable, it has to be the case that seeds do not get eaten so that the seeds can grow and become new grass, which becomes new food for the animals. But if there's so many animals on the commons that all of the grass gets eaten and the seeds get eaten, then the grass doesn't grow again the next season, which means animals are going to start starving or being underfed the next season. So this is the tragedy of the commons. And the problem, of course, is that nobody has any in individual incentive to restrain themselves, right? Even if I, I'm aware of the problem and I really care about trying to keep my livestock fed next season, uh, the problem is, is that there's nothing I can do on my own, right? I have to go and make sure that everybody else also plays fair. And that's the hard part. Uh, but I can't do anything on my own. Uh, so in, in many ways, this is the multiplayer version of the prisoner's dilemma, right? So on my own, I can't get to a better equilibrium. I have to get the cooperation with one other person in the prisoner's dilemma. Now, the tragedy of the commons is worse because I have to get the combinate cooperation of many other people. Okay, now, it's important to note that the tragedy of the commons does not occur because people are overly greedy. Unless you think that going about your life in a rational, normal way is greedy, right? So you might think that, you know, normal self-interest, and by normal here I mean this, the kind of self-interest that's typical for every individual, is too greedy. Perhaps people should be better than they are. Perhaps people should be saints. Uh, but if you think that greedy is people who are excessively self-interested, well, it, the tragedy of the commons, in order for it to occur, doesn't require people to be excessively self-interested. Yes, people excessively consume the resource, that's true, or their animals excessively consume the resource. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're being excessively greedy. It simply is a response to a situation where, once again, they understand very well that if they don't, somebody else will. In other words, the problem is a kind of lack of trust, not greediness per se. Um, Everyone's trying to make a living, for sure, but everyone understands that it would be foolish to trust in the self-restraint of others when it's not in their interest to do so. Um, so in some sense, you have to think that even if you're okay, other people are perhaps going to be greedy. So you're worried about other people. Now, it's also the case that the tragedy comes doesn't come about as a result of lack of education or ignorance. Right? People understand often very well that what they're doing is actively making the problem worse. But what happens frequently if you talk to farmers who are in these sorts of situations, or if you talk to fishers who are overfishing the oceans, uh, or if you talk to people who are polluting uh, the atmosphere quite a bit, um, what they say is, yeah, of course I'm contributing to the problem and making it worse, but I, on my own, if I stop doing what I'm doing, uh, I can't fix the problem, and I bear all the costs of stopping, right? So if I stop polluting, then I make no more income. If I stop fishing, I make no more income. If I stop having sheep and grazing them, uh, I have no more income. Uh, and not only do I have no more income, but I get none of the benefits, right, uh, through unilateral action. So people can understand the problem, they just can't do anything on their own about it. Given that the field is going to be overgrazed no matter what they do, they might as well get as much as they can while they can. This is a rational response. In order for any improvement to be made, they are going to have to coordinate with the other person. They are going to have to get some assurances that others will also restrain their behavior, restrain their consumption of the good. And if they do that, then they can solve the problem and get to a better equilibrium. So like all collective action problems, the tragedy of the commons arises because individuals do not pay the full cost of their behavior. And so they engage in more of that behavior than would be socially useful. If you think about it in, in basic supply and demand versus prices sort of way, when the price of doing something or consuming something goes down, you do more of it, right? When the price goes up, you do less of it. Now, as it turns out, um, the price to you and the price to society uh, might be two different things. Uh, that is to say, uh, and that's where the collective action problem arises. The price to you and the price to society are not the same thing. Um, and frequently, this sort of situation arises when goods are free to use to all or underpriced. So in the case of the commons, generally most people in the village had the right to graze their sheep on the commons. And uh, because they 
can all do so for free and in unlimited quantities, uh, they do it as much as they can. But of course, if that means that the commons can become overgrazed, then they hurt themselves and everybody else in the process. So the tragedy of the commons happens most often where there are no property rights. Remember, the original problem was trying to figure out why the commons were overgrazed, but private pastures were fine. Well, of course, if the pasture is private and it's yours, or you're paying a rent for it, at some level you are paying the cost of and reaping the benefits of all of your actions. So, for example, uh, you know, in a private, um, you don't have to in a private enclosed pasture, you don't have to worry that other people are going to uh, come graze their sheep on your pasture, usually. Uh, and so that means that if if you restrain your consumption, you also get the benefits of the grass next year. Whereas in the commons, if you restrain your consumption, you have no guarantee that you're going to get any of the benefit of that restraint the following year. So uh, private property, private property rights can help um, can equalize the private and social cost of behavior. Um, or another way to do it, uh, if you want to keep access in commons, is for the government to regulate access to the resource. The government can give grazing licenses to each of the shepherds uh, that only permit them to graze so much um, per season or per year, and or have so many sheep on the pasture, limit the number of sheep uh, overall. Uh, make people apply for permits um, and or give or tax people the more sheep they have all of these are ways to create a cost where there was no cost and regulate access um, to the common pool resource and prevent ultimately its depletion um, so these are the two sort of ways to to solve the problem of the of the tragedy of the commons now one of the most uh, divisive issues in modern politics concerns global warming. The most likely current explanation for the recent warming of the planet is an excess of carbon dioxide emissions causing a greenhouse effect and the gradual increases in surface temperatures on the planet. If that's right, then this is a tragedy of the commons. All countries together would be better off if they limited their collective emissions, just like all the shepherds would be better off if they limited the number of sheep that they grazed overall on the pasture so that the pasture could replenish itself and grass could grow the next year. But without any assurances that other countries will do their fair share, no single country can make much of a difference by curving their own emissions. Even if the United States tomorrow were to stop all of its emissions and go back to the Stone Age, uh, and they have no assurance that everybody else wouldn't just keep on doing what they're doing, and the United States would pay the costs of global warming, and uh, I'm sorry, would would reap yes, would pay the costs of trying to stop global warming, but not reap any of the benefits. Global warming would still happen. So, uh, and this is just this is very analogous to the shepherd who, if he you know grazes fewer sheep on the pasture. Um, still probably won't see any benefits of his self-restraint, right? So in the case of global warming, countries can only harm themselves by restraining themselves when other people won't, uh, since global warming will happen anyway, with or without their own contribution, right? So this has spurred the d demand for international agreements, like, for instance, the famous Kyoto Protocol, uh, as attempts to impose some limits and some penalties on those who go over some quota of emissions. The idea is to coordinate uh, you know, a permissible number of emissions to try and gradually reduce the carbon dioxide emissions from each economy in the world. Uh, and again, you can solve the problem or you can make some impact in reducing carbon dioxide emissions uh, if and only if everybody has assurances that everyone is going to play the game and play ball, so to speak. Uh, those countries, uh, if you know China or the United States or Western Europe or other major emitters of pollution do not uh, join the agreement, the agreement fails um, because the problem can only be solved if all or nearly all major polluters actually contribute. And that's the tricky part. And indeed, uh, a lot of these agreements, um, because there is no international government to enforce these agreements, these agreements are largely self-enforced or enforced through sanctions, um, 
these, these agreements are hard to sustain. Not impossible, but hard. So, another important question that the tragedy of the commons can help shed light on is the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution was ratified despite severe objections. Um, and indeed, the United States Constitution, I think, if we look at it objectively, was, uh, if not a betrayal, then a severe retrenchment or a pullback from the libertarian ideals of the American Revolution, of, you know, free individual states, um, you know, exercising, uh, you know, a kind of restrained, mild government. Um, so, if we want to explain the United States Constitution, why it was necessary to create a, a federal government with the power to discipline the states and enforce law, federal law, on the states, uh, we have to look at the problems that arose under the prior Constitution of the United States, uh, the one that uh, one that was in existence uh, from the Revolution, roughly, uh, until 1787, which was called the Articles of Confederation. And one contributing factor, among many, was a tragedy of the commons. Um, that ended up leading to a little-known episode in, in early American history, namely the Oyster Wars. If you've heard about the Oyster Wars, then you'll know a little bit what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, what were the Oyster Wars? Well, the Oyster Wars war occurred over several centuries, really, from the 1630s, um, so the first settlements in North America, until about the 1860s. The states bordering the Chesapeake Bay all wanted to capture uh, lucrative taxes from oyster fishing. When the first settlers came to the Chesapeake Bay, they marveled at just how plentiful oysters were. The Native Americans in the area uh, did not sustain populations large enough or have technologies of fishing uh, that were uh, advanced enough to, uh, you know, really deplete that resource. Um, and so they just the, the, the populations of oysters were just everywhere. You couldn't go anywhere without hitting oysters. Um, and the oysters were also huge. Today we think of oysters as being small. The oysters at the time, uh, from what shells we have and what records we have, were, were massive. Um, so what this meant was this, this sort of abundance, of course, of seemingly free stuff out there, just for anybody who's willing to go and pick it up, uh, meant that um, fishermen at the time would go out armed because it was very well understood that if you didn't fish the area, somebody else would. Um, and uh, so fishermen would go out armed and even raid each other, and so you had a kind of uh, violent competition for resources uh, occurring in the Chesapeake Bay. What was the problem? Why, why such violent competition? Well, yeah, okay, the fishermen were greedy in the sense that they were trying to make a living, uh, and they didn't want to have their livelihoods being threatened by the oyster fishing of others. Um, but the problem was also more basic than that, right? Oysters are a renewable resource, but they only reproduce at a certain rate. And competitive pressures ended up leading fishermen to adopt uh, new techniques to harvest oysters, like dredging. Uh, and what dredging would do was it get, you'd get a bigger catch, and you could get the catch before other people would get them. Uh, the, but that's a problem because the previous methods that didn't rely on dredging tended to spare small oysters, so young oysters. Young oysters are generally smaller than large oysters. Um, I'm sorry, yes, than old oysters. And the previous methods of, of, of harvesting oysters tended to spare small young oysters. The technology just wasn't developed enough to uh, also get the young ones. But of course, if you kill all the young oysters, then that makes it much harder for the population to reproduce itself over time. And uh, indeed, catches got smaller and smaller. We have data on this. Catches got smaller and smaller up in the years leading up to the Constitution of 1787. Uh, it was understood that this was a problem. There used to be this massive abundance in 1630, but by 1787, uh, the oysters were smaller and the catches were much, much less abundance from year to year because of the competitive pressures. Now, of course, we look at this as a tragedy of the commons, we know that the, the rational oyster fisherman is interested in his long-term survival and would much prefer that the oysters reproduce year on year to provide a healthy catch for him every year. But what happens if he doesn't pick up the oysters, especially those young oysters? Well, chances are somebody else will come along and do it in his stead. Uh, so his individual actions don't matter 
as to whether he's going to get more oysters next year or not. He cannot alone do anything about how much uh, how many oysters are going to be available to him next year. So what's his most rational strategy? His most ra ra rational strategy is to uh, get as many oysters as he can, very much very similar to the situation that we observed uh, with the grazing. Okay, so we've looked at this from the point of view of the um, individual fishermen, and we see it as a collective action problem. But let's look at this for a minute from the point of view of the states. Uh, if I'm a state of Maryland and I want to do something about this collective action problem, uh, I can try to outlaw dredging, which um, is severely contributing to the problem, or I can try to limit the size of the oysters that can be harvested, uh, or I can uh, limit, try to limit the size of the catches that people make. Uh, I can try to come up with some legislative remedy that will uh, eventually, uh, or that will try to, to stem the problem. But what happens if I do that, right? Uh, well, uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, Maryland has to have some confidence that Virginia, standing on the other side of the Chesapeake Bay, will also do that. Because if Maryland does it by itself, then all that does is give a huge economic benefit to uh, oyster fishermen in Virginia. And if the oyster fishermen in Virginia do not restrain themselves, then uh, Maryland, uh, Maryland fishermen pay all of the costs of um, of trying to solve the collective action problem with no guarantee that the problem will actually be solved. And indeed, Maryland will receive less tax revenue, which uh, itself is a good self-interested reason for the state not to try to interfere too much, right? And of course, even if Maryland and Virginia can come to some sort of agreement on limiting uh, catch sizes or oyster sizes or the technologies used to fish, um, residents of the District of Columbia or, or people from out uh, outside those two states might uh, sail up the Potomac um, or sail in and start fishing. Uh, so these competitive pressures create a kind of race to the bottom uh, where although each state uh, would prefer to uh, try and uh, limit the size of the catches and try to enable the uh, you know, valuable resource to reproduce itself, neither individually can do very much about it on their own. And wouldn't it be nice if we had some kind of mechanism to uh, ensure that both Virginia and D.C. and Maryland all played by the rules? So, um, like we said, the long run self-interest of the fishermen collides with the pressures put on them by their competitors. And similarly, the long run self-interest of the states collides with pressures put on them by other states. Some fishermen might well not care very much about the future, but note that those who do care about the future still can't do anything to secure that future without the cooperation of everyone else. And if they restrain themselves, they will simply be poorer and still not solve the problem. Indeed, they'll be poorer and unscrupulous fishermen will be richer, at least in the short term, and the oyster population will de decline, making everybody worse off uh, the next year and the year after and the year after. So what these responsible fishermen and responsible states need is the cred a credible framework of rules that give the fishermen on both sides an incentive to restrain their fishing. Um, Virginia and Maryland tried to sign a treaty in 1785 as sovereign states, and that clearly did not work. Uh, and many people saw the case for a federal power capable of restraining both sides as getting stronger because these bilateral agreements between independent states didn't seem to be working very well. Each side had a very, very strong incentive to defect and a strong incentive to not cooperate. Remember, uh, in the prisoner's dilemma, and we're just talking about two states, we can talk about it as a prisoner's dilemma, uh, the dominant strategy is to always defect, not cooperate. Uh, and if the other side is cooperating, then you have a very strong incentive to... Uh, if, if the other side is cooperating, you have a strong incentive to not cooperate. Uh, in other words, uh, cooperating, cooperate, cooperate is not an equilibrium, right? Because you can make yourself better off by simply violating the agreement. And because there was no framework to enforce the treaty, on both states. There was no power higher than Virginia and Maryland to uh, impose penalties on Virginia and Maryland fishers for overfishing. 
uh, then uh, the treaty failed, right? And the problem was that port officials in Maryland, Virginia, didn't really trust the other side to keep its word, and unscrupulous fishermen uh, like to bribe these port officials. Um, you know, and this is this, you know, the fact that neither side was particularly comfortable holding up their end of the bargain was one thing, uh, but one the reason that it's not particularly comfortable holding up their end of the bargain is that how do you know that the other side is not secretly cheating? You have a monitoring and enforcement problem. How do you know that fishermen aren't going out in the middle of the night to try and dredge up some more oysters more than they're allowed to? You really don't. And with 1785 technologies, you really, really don't. It's not like we can GPS track uh, sailboats at the time. Okay. So let's conclude. Collective action problems are multiplayer prisoner's dilemmas, and the key feature of collective action problem is that the private cost of individual behavior is smaller than its social cost. Right? The private cost, it costs less to me than it, than it costs to society that I consume a particular resource. And one particular variation of the collective action problem is called the tragedy of the commons, uh, which states that without effective rules, governing the use of common pool resources, the renewable resource gets depleted and everybody ends up suffering. Now, in order to combat collective action problems and tragedies of the commons, uh, I'm sorry, fighting, combating collective action problems and tragedies of the commons is one of the main reasons anyone supports the creation of political institutions. Uh, we want these institutions, we want things like the federal government over the states uh, and a government over individuals because the government can impose penalties or rewards to try to influence people away from uh, the uh, previous equ equilibrium and get them to a better equilibrium. Now, uh, it can, it usually does this through, by, through threats and through uh, rewards. Now, so self-interested players can't really see a way out on their own, but if they can use coordinating mechanisms and institutions and political institutions, uh, that can help pursue their collective self-interest. And remember, the fishermen's long-term interest is to maintain the stocks. The, the shepherd's long-term self-interest is to uh, maintain the grazing field. But once again, uh, they can't pursue that interest on their own. They can only pursue that interest with the cooperation of everybody else who has access to the common pool resource. So, um, if you can provide sets of rules to give incentive to the players to restrain their self-interest, you can solve this problem. In effect, you create a new equilibrium where the equilibrium is that it's in my self-interest to restrain myself because if I don't, I'm going to get punished. And if everybody feels that pressure, then everyone uh, is likely to restrain their behavior. In other words, what the rules do is they align the private cost and the social cost of individual behavior, right? They bring them into alignment. We said the private cost was lower than the social cost. By raising the private cost of fishing or grazing or catching oysters or polluting or what have you, by raising or emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, by raising the private cost of doing that, by imposing penalties and the threats of penalties, uh, it makes it makes that private cost align more closely with the social cost of uh, of that behavior.